Thank you all for joining us. I am Arthur K. Zakin, and on behalf of YALA, the International Armenian Literary Alliance, welcome to the second reading of Don't Look Away, our literary series for Artsakh. We are here tonight because on September 27th, Azerbaijan, directly aided by Turkey, launched a massive assault on Nagorno-Karabakh, an ethnically Armenian enclave known to Armenians as Artsakh. For two weeks now, both Artsakh and the Republic of Armenia have been under attack. Stepanakert, the capital of Artsakh, has been relentlessly bombarded by drones, missile strikes, and military aircraft. Azerbaijan is targeting not only military forces, but also the civilian population and vital infrastructure like hospitals, churches, and schools. Evidence shows that they have used lethal Israeli-made cluster munitions, illegal under international law. Cluster munitions scatter hundreds of sub-munitions, up to 20% of which fail to explode and are left behind to inflict suffering on civilians for decades. A slew of propaganda and disinformation have flooded social media and mainstream news outlets. Both Armenia and Azerbaijan accuse each other of breaking the short-lived ceasefire. After three weeks of war, many have lost their homes, hiding in churches and cellars flecked with shattered glass and bombarded with shrapnel. Erdogan's involvement and support of Azerbaijan at an opportune time has genocidal implications, and its parallel to the events from 100 years ago is haunting to say the least. In 1915, while the rest of the world was preoccupied with World War I and the Spanish flu, Armenians sounded the alarm, but nobody stopped the Ottoman Empire and the atrocities led by the Young Turks. It is no coincidence that in 2020, this attack was launched on the brink of one of the most crucial presidential elections in the United States, and during a time when global fascism is once again on the rise in the midst of a pandemic. With over 500 confirmed deaths, the body count rises while the war for Nagorno-Karabakh grows into a regional conflict. According to official reports, Turkey denies deploying Syrian mercenaries to Artsakh. But, what, but recent sources illustrate that the Turkish government has mobilized over 1,650 jihadist mercenaries from Syria and elsewhere to fight in the conflict. In addition, the US signed a joint statement with France and Russia condemning Azerbaijan and Armenian forces for allowing the war to escalate into a regional bloodbath. Thankfully, another humanitarian ceasefire has been declared starting at midnight. Let us hope this one is respected. The world must hear the plight of the Armenians as we mobilize in solidarity and protest against our erasure. We occupy the streets of Los Angeles, Milaga, Milan, Brussels, Vienna, Boston, Philadelphia, Valencia, Berlin, Fresno, Las Vegas, Paris, and the list goes on. We march with our red, blue, and orange flags, our peace signs. We greet our neighbors with kindness because we want to live in harmony with the rest of the world. Last week, Carolyn Forche told us the only resistance she received for her anthology against forgetting was by editors who were dismissive about publishing the first section on the Armenians. It's not our place in history that poses a threat to publishers. It's that the strategy of erasure has succeeded in such a way to make Armenians seem unimportant, when really the Armenian genocide is the very seed of unanswered violence. I'd like to open the reading with a poem I wrote dedicated to the civilians who gave up their lives and soldiers who also risk theirs, so we will not be eradicated from our land and history. Rain. After he hugs his family goodbye, he passes umbrellas and park benches, sees the edge of a vexed flower petal and thinks the flower is a man off to war. Without looking back, he can hear his children kicking laughter in and out of him. His wife's throat, a gleam of sandlight. Fifteen years later, rain beats out a puddle in the shape of his body. Thank you for being here, for listening to our stories, our poetry, our call to action. We are here to voice protest against 
unconscionable terror occurring on both sides of this conflict. Thank you for helping us raise awareness to stop the war and to raise money and aid for Artsakh. You can log on to our Facebook page, International Alliance of Literary Armenians to make a donation. The link will be placed in the chat. Or you can make a donation directly to armeniafund.com. Currently, we have raised $7,142. We are trying to reach our goal of $10,000. Please help us do that. Donate if you can, and please share the link. Without further ado, it is my honor to introduce our first speaker. Lola Kundakshin is an Armenian poet, editor, and artist. She is a longtime resident of New York City where she has reached and read her work in various venues. In 2019, Lola participated in two panels at AWP in Portland, Oregon, dedicated to the memory of Diana Derhovenesian and on the topic of permanent longing, connecting across borders and writing about lost homelands. In the past decade, she was an invitee to five international poetry festivals, twice in Medellin, Lima, Ramallah, Trois Rebriers, and Santiago. Lola co-curates a poetry reading series at the Zorab Information Center in Midtown Manhattan, and since 2006 has promoted Armenian culture with texts, translations, and audio for the Armenian Poetry Project. She is the author of The Accidental Observer, published in 2011, now in its second printing, Advice to a Poet, published in 2014, and The Moon in the Cusp of My Hand for, in 2020. In describing her versatility, Michael E. Stone says her poems tread lightly but so perceptively in delicate language and in three tongues. To understand the magnitude of Lola's work, Diana Derhovenesian said, the poetry reading community owes a huge debt of gratitude to Lola Kundakjian for her years of service to the art, making the work of Armenian poets, writers of Armenian ancestry in many languages available to readers worldwide. It is my great pleasure and honor to introduce to you Lola Kundakjian. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for Yala being formed at this crucial time in our history. I'm honored to be reading with old friends and you. I'm going to read three pieces. The first one is about a portrait that I discovered in London. Um, it was the portrait of a woman wearing a beautiful red dress and a white hat. As I approached the painting, I saw it described as an Armenian woman. It's by Charles Zachary Landell and it's at the Wallace Collection in London. Portrait of an Armenian woman. She wears her traditional dress and jewelry on her wedding day, or perhaps at her son's baptism, her firstborn in the arms of godparents, the procession on the altar, the priest anointing her dewy child and blessing him. But why this gaze of sadness? Is a premonition weighing her mind a century separates us and I wish to tell her she was right. There were many executions and deportations without justice or recognition. I want to know her name. Did her family survive? Could I be her descendant? The second one has an epigraph by Lord Byron from the destruction of Senna Cherib 1815 and it reads, the Assyrian came down like the wolf on the fold and his cohorts were gleaming in purple and gold. And the sheen of their spears was like stars on the sea when the blue wave rolls nightly in deep Galilee. Upon reading about the destruction of ancient statues in the Near East, was the master carver at the Ninve palace an anonymous artist, or was he recognized for his talents? And the artist who sculpted Ashurnashirpal II out of Magnesite in 9th century BC and the winged creature in alabaster. You, the metal workers of Urartu, and you who wrote the annals of Senna Sherib in wet clay. You who placed the scarab in a gold ring in Cyprus, and you 
who in Rhodes knitted gild, gold to make a rosetta. You who shaped a nude goddess with lotus flowers in ivory, and you who in Egypt invented glass. You in Crete who forged bronze balls with your hammer, and you who invented sirens and attached them to cauldrons. You who carved jasper, carnelian, blue steatite, ivory, chalcedony, lapis lazuli, banded agate, and you who invented repoussé and granulation. You who leafed gold over silver and covered urns entirely with it, and you who formed earrings out of gold and glass paste and gold bracelets. What survives? As you see, I am very much um, inspired by the arts. I was a formerly a visual artist before I became full the time dedicating my time to poetry. And this piece is entitled In Search of Rilke at the Metropolitan Museum of Art after a reading of Archaic Torso. And I hope this is a bit more, uh, a happier piece for you. A Sunday afternoon, the final lazy weekend of the summer, I escape to the cool bright corridors of that art institution. I am in search of Apollo or Rilke. In the Hellenistic and Roman wing, I find Hermes, Eros, Heracles, headless torsos of young men and women, centaurs, athletes, and heroes. I turn around each statue and sepulcher, reading labels and descriptions. In desperation, I ask a guard, but she's clueless. I search for him in a cubiculum nocturnum, that is to say bedroom, in galleries, in the faces and camera lenses of tourists, finally finding him through old fashioned help, the humble assistance of the information desk clerk. There are two Apollos here, one in worse shape than the other, one slightly taller, one still resting against a marble trunk, one with more genitals intact, more of the hip areas defined with both feet, perfect toes and toenails. The Japanese tourist photographs her friend grabbing, or is it covering the genitals? I hear the guard laughing heartily. Men, women, and children walk by. Few stop by to look at the headless torso. Few read the description. Few acknowledge that this was Apollo. This was the god of music and poetry, son of Zeus, father of Orpheus, one of the 12 Olympians, D.E. Consentis. Who cares for those lesser gods and heroes when Apollo is in the room? And still, I don't find Rilke, a man at least in some form or manner representing him, his essence, or a man who has read his work, a man aware of that dilemma could mid career or a life crisis. I wonder if I tear a piece of paper, write in bold capital letters Rilke and hold it up, will someone stop and chat with me, sit and read with me that poem, ask me questions about it, maybe exchange something about himself a revelation found through this encounter. If any answer to man's inner quest is to be found on earth, it could be at these feet or another work of art, at this museum or another like it, in this city or another metropolis such as the many found on this or other continents. And yet his torso is still suffused with brilliance from inside, like a lamp, in which his gaze, now turned to low, gleams in all its power. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Lola. Uh, I'm left with the words from the second piece you read, what survives? Thank you. Armin Davudian is the author of Swan Song, which won the 2020 Frost Place Chapbook Competition. His poems and translations appear in Agni, the Sewanee Review, the Yale Review, and elsewhere. He grew up in Isfahan, Iran, and is currently a PhD candidate at Stanford University. In praise of Armin's superb work, Dick Davis describes Armin's poetry as very rich, rich with histories, cultures, and contexts. In illustrating the incantational effect of Swan Song, 
Patrick Donnelly purports, this marvelous book casts a spell, the reservoirs of desire filling and emptying in rhythmic cycles, and reading it is a visit with a charmed voice. Long may it sing. Without further ado, it is my honor to introduce to you, Armen Davoudi. Thank you, Arthur. Um, it's, a, it's a great privilege to be reading um, with this group of writers for Yala. And um, the occasion is so great, I feel like that uh, no words could possibly rise up to it, but this is just what I have. Um, photograph. His face tanned almost to the faded tone of the adobe alcove. Father's father sits in his handsome sixties, chestnut gone now from his hair and looking like he'd rather not look where he's looking. Set within the keyhole portico of a church front, is it? The windows periwinkle blue unlocks a summer morning sky outside the frame. Outside the frame, I missed the glass and clean away last summer's promise to return the coming summer. I'm always going back on going back. The years rack up new names, new cousins and new headstones I can't visit while undeclared wars smolder on slow burn. Um, this next poem is titled Ararat, and it alludes to the sort of legend that um, Noah's Ark landed on Ararat. And um, if you remember the story, uh, Noah sends out a raven first to see if um, the flood has dried, and then the raven never comes back, so he sends out a dove. And then the dove comes back with an olive branch. Ararat. When I left home, I thought I was the raven, sounding the future for echoes of my voice. Sunlight tore and stitched back sea and heaven, and daily I renewed my prodigal choice. Never, never. I turned my own name over above the raving ocean, content to watch my shadow and my image almost touch once every day, forever and forever. But when did I swap feathers with the dove, coughing up splinters from the olive branch I'll never carry back? The shattered conch of Noah's ark was dug up from his grave. But this is where I live now. Should I cry? Ku, ka, my house is made of straw. And I'll read one more poem. And um, before doing that, I just wanted to thank you all for being here. The Book of Kings. I lie in my room reading while their tense, angry voices, lowered to a murmur, seep through the door. In the book, a warrior ends another's life and strips him of his armor, an heirloom armlet glinting underneath. It's just a book, but every time I read, it ends with the same fight. He kills his son, then covers him in gold embroidered cloth. I'm young enough to cry, but old enough to shut my eyes as soon as the door swings open and my father tiptoes in to say good night. He pulls the book of kings out of my hands, takes my glasses off to kiss my head and tucks me into bed. Thanks. Thank you so much, Armin. That was beautiful. My house is made of straw. Left with that. Our next speaker 
is Nairi Hakverdi. Nairi Hakverdi is a writer and translator of modern Armenian literature. Her literary translation of modern and contemporary Armenian authors have appeared on several international platforms, including Asymptote and Words Without Borders. Since 2015, she has also participated in screenwriting. Her first screenplay, The Driver, received several accolades, including a selection of the Berlin Nail Talents Project Market in 2018. She's currently working on her second feature length screenplay, Elena Cake. Nairi was born in the Netherlands, where she grew up and received a degree in English language and literature. She moved to Armenia in 2009. Nairi's work in Armenia is crucial since she bears witness to the atrocities in Artsakh through online journal entries, giving account to particular occurrences that otherwise are unobtainable to outside media outlets. An anonymous source gives praise to Nairi's work as the path to peace and justice. Thank you for being with us here today, Nairi. Hi, uh, sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, for inviting me here. Um, so I wanted to read um, two entries from what I call my PTSD diaries on Facebook. Uh, I've kind of been recording stuff. I felt the need to share certain feelings that I was feeling while being here on the ground. Um, I don't really have a specific format. It's very free, it's loose. I, I write what I, what I see, I write what I feel. Um, the sorts of things that I see around me. And um, yeah, so, so that's basically the format of these diaries. So I'll read two entries. One is from earlier on, October 4th, and one from a little bit later, October 12th. All right, October 4th. It's 3 a.m. and I'm shaky. I saw my hairdresser today. Her eyes were bloodshot. I didn't ask if she'd been crying or not sleeping. We don't ask each other how we are anymore. We already know, scared, anxious, sad, uncertain. A mother whose 18 year old son will be buried soon cries. I don't want you to be a hero, she says. I want you to be alive. Everyone has their heads in their phones. They're not looking at pet videos. They're not sharing trivial memes. They're not taking selfies. We're counting casualties like we were counting COVID cases a week ago. Stepana Kert has been shelled all day. Long range missiles and heavy rockets are targeting civilian settlements and infrastructure. Everyone has moved underground into bunkers. I search through international media. I click on the BBC, The Guardian, The New York Times. We're not front page news. We're buried deep in the search pages as separatists, as occupiers, as equally guilty. And no one seems to know who started all this. Lights go out in Stepanakert after the electrical grid is attacked. I'm with a friend. There's only one topic on our minds. We speculate and contemplate. We try to predict the unpredictable. We're continually searching for grounding to keep us from falling. I find myself staring into space as my mind races anxiously. I get requests to join efforts to translate, to edit, to write, to get the word out. But I want to say the word is already out. It's been out for a week already. October 12. I'm sitting in the back of a taxi with my ear on the radio and my head in my phone. The taxi slows down and comes to a halt. I briefly glance up and go back to my phone. It's just another traffic jam. A friend tells me she attended a funeral. She said when they buried the boy a week ago, his was the third grave in that row. When she went back to visit the grave a week later, the row was already completely full. A soldier on the front line calls up his girlfriend. He tells her his buddy was just killed next to him. He tells her, take down this number, it's his girlfriend's. He asked me to ask you to call her and tell her. I scroll through Facebook and see one headshot after another. He was brave and handsome. He was kind and talented. We lost another bright future. We lost another big brain. A surgeon in Stepanaker talks about the injuries he's seeing. They're not simple, he says. These kids are being blown to pieces by 21st century mighty weapons, he says. 
My taxi driver lowers the volume of the radio and whispers, they're bringing the soldiers. I look out the window and search for a military vehicle. I ask him, where? He points with his head over there, going up the hill to the military cemetery. I'm transfixed. A never ending procession of cars cuts through our standstill and creeps up the hill, carrying one mourner after another to fresh new graves. At night, after the sun has set, a row of cars honking and tooting sends off more soldiers to the military theater. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nairi. Um, in an era where we are, uh, we're being silenced, your accounts mean everything. We appreciate you so much for being here. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Aline Terzian Zaytunian. Aline Terzian Zaytunian's first book, Deep as Cities Ache, explores the Lebanese civil conflict, both environmentally and psychologically. Her poems have appeared in anthologies like the Colorado Review, Cordite, Levitate, Media Cake, Liminal Women, Duende, and Rise Up Review. Aline received her master's and master's in fine arts and creative writing with an emphasis in poetry. She is currently working on her doctorate in education in the leadership and innovation program at ASU. She also serves as the English department chair at College of the Canyons, where she teaches creative writing and is the faculty advisor of COC's award-winning literary magazine, Cul-de-Sac. She currently lives in Torrance, California with her husband and daughter. In Love Letter to Beirut, Aline's lyrical sweep reminds us of our mortality during dark times. Underneath patched holes, bullet holes remain to stain your reputation. It is with great pleasure I introduce to you Aline Terzian Zaytunia. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me to this really um, momentous and extremely important event. Um, I really want to encourage you to please donate um, to the cause because it's very important that we get as many um, funds raised in order to uh, help our comrades in our homeland. Thank you, Arthur and Olivia and everyone at Yala for um, putting this together. And I want to start, I'm going to read three poems. Um, and uh, as Arthur said, I write primarily about Lebanon or that region, uh, but I've been noticing so much of my work these days has been around social justice. So um, this one is about Syria, so which is where my mother was born. Um, so this is called Syria 2016. The smell of tar and almonds is strongest after morning rain. At 5 a.m., the neighbors flee to Latakia on bicycles, baskets full of bread and ham. He watches them pedal, reckless in their rush, thinks of scurrying rats with food in their whiskers. Through his one open window, an upended swing set, overripe apricots smeared on concrete, the smoking ash of his best friend's house. No one else is above ground, no slaps of jump rope on pavement, no rickety chestnut carts, not one sound except the hissing of a gas line and the ringing in his ear. His house with the three walls, his room with the bed beneath the window, the peeling paint, the persistent record player, his slippers, tobacco pipe, and the broken granite under his feet. What's left of a life but the roots? And that poem, I didn't wanna say at the beginning because I didn't want you to picture it, but I don't know if you saw that viral photograph of the man sitting in his home uh, with a gramophone in front of him and just rubble underneath. Um, this poem was inspired by that photograph. So thank you. And then this is my newest poem, actually. I don't usually read newer poems because, you know, I need to sit with them for, for a minute before I feel comfortable, but uh, I felt that the, the need was there for this today. Um, this is Hangar 12, Beirut, and I'm sure if you're following 
any news stories, you heard about the explosion uh, that happened in Lebanon and decimated so much of my homeland. That's where I was born. Uh, and it still st sits with me, um, this, this rock on my chest. Uh, this poem is for my cousin George because he was posting so many, he's a doctor in Beirut and he was posting so many um, messages of him walking in the neighborhood and trying to do humanitarian work. So I wrote this for him. Hangar 12, Beirut. In the morning, there is nothing but the steel door frame bent at a devastating angle. Your neighbor is pounding his fists in the apartment next door, a call and response. You do not take the bait. In the morning, the wind carries debris inside, sheet music, a candy wrapper, a woolen sock. On the street, someone has written, the people shall rise in the ashy windshield of a car. That morning, you step through your door frame into neighborhood, into glass and fumes to search for what's buried. A woman plays the violin on a balcony. A first responder breathes into a paper bag. A grandfather sweeps the sidewalk. For six years, it lay in wait to rewrite Beirut's landscape, to leave you homesick in its ruin. And my last poem um, brings us back to the United States. And I'd just like to encourage everyone to please vote. Um, so this one is, uh, is really difficult because my, I have an eight-year-old daughter. And this is about the, um, the camps, the migrant camps that where the children have been imprisoned. Uh, this one is, uh, and this one is looking at you know, in general, um, but specifically I was focusing on the one in Texas where all the reports were coming out of. This is 4th of July at the migrant camp. And I was trying to juxtapose my daughter's experience with 4th of July with the children who are in these camps. There you are, America, with your sparklers and pizzazz, a pyrotechnic giant a lover of blast caps and bang snaps, all the force of a Saturn cell, trailing silver smoke behind you like a goddess. If I didn't know better, I would think you were beautiful with your miles of meadows and mountains, your rocky shores, your flatlands, your face full of poppies and sunflowers, lit up by the sun, you are glowing, America. And just down the road, watching from their pens, those babies in tinfoil, looking up at the horsetail, an exploding waterfall of red, the fountains of dripping stars, the bombettes and bottle rockets ignited rosy like a chrysanthemum or a peony, the night sky, a gleaming spectacle, and my own child clapping in glee. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Aline. Uh, we completely relate to you about your homeland and what's happening. Uh, being war children and and uh, and coming from such uh, from such trauma. I remember uh, what happened in Lebanon uh, short uh, about a month ago. Thank you for reading. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mashinka Firunz Hakopian. Mashinka Firunz Hakopian is a writer, researcher, and artist born in Yerevan and residing in Glendale, California. She is a senior researcher at the Bergruen Institute in the Transformations of the Human Program. She holds a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania and held a teaching appointment at UCLA's Department of English from 2017 to 2019. She is an associate editor at Noema Magazine and a contributing editor at the Los Angeles Review of Books. Mashinka is a fierce advocate for Armenians and the presence of Armenian literature and art. In her essay, Valley View, an Armenian diasporic account in lieu of a Glendale Biennial Review, 
Mashinka confronts the exclusion of Armenians from an artist-run commercial gallery curated by the Pitt and hosted by the Brand Library and Art Center in Glendale, California. Mashinka reports that the Pitt's exclusion proceeded despite the fact that the city's Armenian diaspora constitutes approximately 40% of its overall population. Her ability to draw attention to the erasure of Armenians in order to demarcate our presence within our local literary communities is the mark of an artist who is also an activist and truly remarkable. Her book, Algorithmic Bias, Lectures for Intelligent Machines is forthcoming in 2021 from X Artists Books. Thank you for being here, Mashinka, and for sharing your work. Thank you so much, Arthur, for that incredible introduction. And thank you to you and Olivia and Yala for organizing this, this crucial fundraiser. Uh, I hope that anyone who can and hasn't already can, will donate. And if you have and can again, please donate again. Um, I wanna begin by reading a few lines from Alekhiki Sahakyan, who was a poet and activist in the Armenian Revolutionary Federation who fought for uh, Armenia's liberation struggle. Um, he, he described the situation in Soviet era uh, Karabakh as follows. Karabakh is completely cut off from Armenia. It has neither newspapers nor books. There are no textbooks in Armenian. Baku does not print any. Is this a consequence of heartlessness or a systemic policy? The local youth is boiling and wants to speak, but there are no opportunities. I want to preface my own reading with an excerpt uh, from a poem by Isa Hakyan, who I'm fortunate to call my uh, great great uncle. Um, the poem is untitled from 1898, and it was written against the backdrop of the Ottoman Empire's Sumerian massacres, uh, which resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of Armenians. I saw a lake in my dream, an azure and tranquil lake. Upon its solitary shore, I had fallen down wounded. Panting gently and softly, the lake was an endless thought and my deep wound pained me while I was powerless in despair. And a voice flowed into my soul, a voice from a tender sacred heart. It was my mother calling to me from the shores of my native land. When I die, O oh, bury me upon the slopes of Alakyaz, that the winds from Montash may blow upon me and depart. Um, we were asked to share some remarks about the crisis in Artsakh, and rather than speaking extemporaneously, I wanna read um, a few lines from an essay that I've been working on over the last few weeks for the LA Review of Books. Fabulations and geopolitical fictions swirl around accounts of the crisis in Artsakh. In a breathtaking redaction of the historical record, media narratives stage a scene of military offensives and clashes unfolding between equally matched belligerents. Each time these scenes appear, they flatten the reality of Armenian liberation efforts into a tale of territorial dispute in West Asia. They erase one determinative fact that the indigenous Armenian peoples who live in the Republic of Artsakh are now engaged in a struggle for self-determination. Bombarded by cluster munitions, suicide drone strikes, and untold human rights violations, Artsakh's people defend their right to live and to govern themselves on ancestral lands populated by Armenians since antiquity. To characterize the scenario otherwise is not to commit a semantic error it is to falsely authorize Azerbaijan's claim to stolen indigenous territory and to enable its Turkish allies' neo-Ottoman genocidal gambit. Today, settler colonial logic suffuses the statements issued by Azerbaijan and Turkey's autocratic rulers who comprise noted kleptocrats and petro-oligarchs. Erdogan has pledged fulsome support to Turkey's Azerbaijani proxy state and has publicly vowed to continue the mission of Armenian extermination, quote, which his grandfathers have carried out for centuries in the Caucasus. What resounds in these words, if not the familiar coupling of settler sovereignty with genocidal sentiment? Confronted with the prospect of a peace process, Aliyev has rejoined, Azerbaijan has one condition. Nagorno-Karabakh is the territory of Azerbaijan. We must return and we shall return. 
What is this but the imagining of a settler futurity that has exterminated all remnants of indigenous Armenian life and life worlds? At this moment, Artsakh grapples with hundreds of lives extinguished and the displacement of 75,000 people. In its capital of Stepanakert, the remaining civilians shelter in their basements. The city has been transformed into a dystopic nightmare scape of debris, rocket shells, and vital infrastructural wreckage punctuated by plumes of billowing black smoke. The global response to these conditions is tantamount to a cacophony of silence. Um, and I wanna finish with a short prose poem I wrote in 2018 about the Mushu Charantid. The Mushu Charantid is a 13th century Armenian illuminated manuscript weighing approximately 60 pounds, roughly twice the weight of a gold bar. The book was discovered by two Armenian women in the territory of the Ottoman Empire in 1915, amid Turkey's genocidal campaign against the Armenian people. The women had reason to believe that the manuscript would be destroyed, but neither of them was able to carry it alone because of its tremendous weight. So they divided it into two parts and each transported half of the manuscript 60 pounds traveling the distance between the Mush province over the border of Georgia, allegedly carrying the book on their backs. The two halves of the manuscript were eventually reunited and are now on display at the Matanadaran, the Institute of Ancient Armenian Manuscripts in Yerevan. The manuscript is identified as, quote, Armenia's largest book. My mother used to tell me the story of the Mushu Charantid a story about how bodies, and particularly feminized bodies, are asked to carry archives across great distances and great territories, weighted down by many kilograms of collective memory work in order to bring our histories into the present. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mashinka. The way you right now just weave personal history with official history, um, we, we're, we have so much gratitude for your dedication um, and your courage for fighting back this ideological war that has plagued us. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Alan Samarjian. Award-winning writer, musician, and educator, Alan Samarjian's writing has appeared in several notable print and online publications and anthologies over the years, including Adbusters, The Brooklyn Rail, and Diagram. He released a chapbook of poems called An Improvised Device by Lock and Load Press, Gathering for the Tribes in 2005, and his first full-length book In the Architecture of Bone by Gen Pop Books in 2009. His music has been featured in television and film and charted on CMJ. He has performed over a thousand shows all over North America, exploring the range of alternative and inventive rock music in a myriad of bands and as a solo artist. Among his recognitions are a New York State English Council Educator of Excellence Award in 2008, a distinction of finalist for the New Song Recordings New Song Contest in 2012, and grants in 2017 and 2018 from the Armenian General Benevolent Union and Creative Armenia for a collaboration of poetry and music called The Serpent and the Crane with Vancouver-based guitarist Adam Bajakian. In praise of their collaboration, Armenian Weekly says, they come together to create something new, at times fierce and other times tender, and always in service of the urgent relevance of, of one of history's most horrific and complex chapters. Alan was caretaker and resident of the Walt Whitman birthplace from 1998 to 2001, where he co-founded an experimental arts collective called The Body Electric, one of many community-centered series he has curated over his career. He was a columnist for Long Island Pulse magazine for 10 years and earned several Long Island Press Club awards for his innovative writing on culture and the arts. He earned his MFA at Goddard College in 2002 and currently teaches English at Herrick's High School in New Hyde Park, New York. Alan recently moved with his partner and their son from New York City's East Village to New Hyde Park, New York. He's also the grandson of the Cubist Impressionist painter and Armenian genocide survivor, Simon Sapsonia. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce to you, Alan Sermejian. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Uh, really honored to be part of um, such fine company for this. And I want to just extend gratitude to Arthur and Olivia at Yala for giving the world the space we so uh, desperately need. Um, many of the readers uh, today and the speakers today already said some, you know, really just important uh, sentiments, but I just want to add, you know, part of how all this injustice will be reconciled uh, and self-determination and truth and freedom be realized in Artsakh specifically, but uh, in afar as well as when authoritarians, I think near and far are released from their leadership duties. I just wanted to sort of put that out there. Um, this is a poem called Grandchildren of Genocide. <clears throat> we think of bomb fields and big when we think of genocide. We think of mass cleansing, we think in holes, we think the whole page. We think what's under it, what they've been covering up, we think there might have been people in those whole pages. We think of chambers when we think of genocide, we think of people crying, we think of people climbing. We think of people climbing and crying, crying and climbing. We think of both people climbing and people crying. We think in chambers. We think in those horrible chambers when we think of genocide, those horrible 20th century chambers. When we think of genocide, we don't think of mountains and deserts. We don't think of bazaars. When we do think of them, we don't think of young democratic people and pomegranates. We don't think of young democratic people with pomegranates at bazaars when we think of genocide. We don't think of them next to our grandfathers. We don't think next to them. Then there are young democratic people who don't eat pomegranates and don't think of genocide. We don't think of them either. We don't think of them when we think of genocide, but we do think of mustaches. We don't think of long and lovely mustaches, but we think of mustaches when we think of genocide. When we think of genocide, we think of families. We think of faces of families, but we don't think of birth. When we think of birth, we don't think about babies, but we do think of mothers. When we think about genocide, we do think about mothers, but we do think of mothers, but we don't think of women. We don't think of women dancing. We don't hear the music when we think of genocide. These things we think about and do not hear when we think about genocide. And we don't think of civil war as genocide. We hear about it. We don't call in enough with such information. We think about reconciliation, but we don't think about reconciliation when we think about genocide. We don't study the memorials. We don't explain the play in papers. We don't shake hands and make up. When we think of genocide, we do other things with our hands. Let me try something uh, just written. Um, some terrific photographs um, from EVM report and some other places have been in my consciousness the last few weeks. So this is in response to some of that. There's a hole in the church of my heart, a fire in the palm of the young boy's mind. There's loss at the monument of topple, unannounced at midday unsteadiness. There are 15 minutes to see the birds when my breath and its runes escape me. There are myths of intention circling skies like vultures and parades of new madrigal incantations. 
Letters of former words scattering away from clusters of pages, munitions. There's a swallowing of whole tongues, a burying of more than just heads. In the afternoon, these voices seek shade to complete their inconceivable sentences. In the evening, there is a snake in the black garden. The children begin to chase its tail again because there is no other play. I see the moon through the whole of the night, and I know at least that in the thickening smoke and holy gaze, I am not alone. And just one more. Um, this is a poem by, a short poem by uh, Diana de Jovanesian. And um, it's called Armenian Obsidian. And I've just, it's been going over in my head a lot as well the last few weeks. Some call this rock volcanic glass or devil's fingernails that claw their way out of what is past in arrowheads that now reclaim the old bows our ancestors aimed at mountain slopes for mountain game. Others say they're mirrored arcs curving without cleavage, dark after years reflecting back invaders whose hearts were black. They're from lost times and tides, but others say these stones begun as black pieces of night sky solidified, falling to earth, wanting to see our sun. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan, for sharing your work with us today. Next to them, we don't think. That, that strikes me. Um, really amazing work. Thank you so much. Thank you. I would like to close this out with a poem I wrote. Um, it's also called Ararat. Um, Armin and I have a <laughs> similar title. Um, Ararat. My brothers and sisters call me Ara, which means friend, which is also a name which can be short for Ararat, the mountain behind an imaginary line in another country. It used to be in the backyard of our home. In a way, it represents betrayal. In a way, it looks like fog in the sky, a god with untouchable snow peaks. A longtime friend, like Arak or the vodka Arak, meaning we drink and drink until the empty bottle rolls off the table. And when it rolls, the sound of its rumble resembles the growl of a dog. The police say we are bad. When punched in the mouth, blood runs down the lip like ice turned water. We wipe the chin. Our boys learn to place their pain in a grave. My heart feels like charcoal is what my cousin says. His bloody lip trembles, chest out like an elevated rock. Let it out, I say. He weeps until the water moistens the caves around his eyes. The police say we are bad, but we are just on bad land. I throw my arm around his shoulder. It's okay, we're here now. I say it because his lip is on fire, because he is my ara, because the police say we are bad. The stolen lunch tickets, the bully beatdowns, the way we cross the endless borderlands of death. Because we have tried to be boys for an entire generation after the loss of our mountain. Thank you all for being here, for this reading, and for sharing your incredible work. Thank you to all the organizations who have responded with fundraisers and aid. You can donate to our fundraiser. The link is in the chat. If you don't have Facebook, you can visit our website, armenianliterary.org, for a list of charities to donate to directly and to learn more about the conflict from credible sources.
Visit ANCA.org to contact your local representative, to ask Congress and the White House to pressure Baku for peace, to cut all military aid to Azerbaijan being used against Armenian civilians, and to warn Turkey against sending arms and fighters to Baku. Thank you to everyone who made this possible, especially Olivia Katranjian. Thank you to the International Alliance of Literary Armenians, to John Paul Der Bogosian, Levin Golandukin. Special thank you to Cyrus Sapobody, Ruth Christopher, Lucinek Katrian, and to all of our speakers, Lola Kundakchin, Nairi Hakverdi, Aline Terzian Zaytunian, Mashinka Firun Sakopian, Armin Davudian, and Alan Samerjian. Thank you again for joining us. Stay tuned for future events. May we find peace.